welcome to The Behavioral View. everyone, would you like to get a CEU for this episode? Listen closely for the announcement of three secret words delivered throughout the episode. Take note of those words and we'll tell you where to go to get your CEU when the show is over. Hi everyone, welcome to the Behavioral View. My name is Shannon Hill. I am your host and I am the Editor-in-Chief at Central Reach Institute. Here today with Nissa. You want to say hi Nissa? Hi, everyone. My name is Nissa Van Etten. I'm the Director of Assessment and Clinical Training here at Central Reach. And Carrie Millico is sick today, and so she has passed the ball with, to the amazing Tim Fuller. Tim, say hi. <laughs> well, hello. Hello. I, I'm Tim Fuller, sitting in for Dr. Millico. I work uh, here at Central Reach in the Clinical Program Department. Really excited to uh, not only meet Lori, but uh, get some time with uh, some, some great colleagues. Yeah, we're really excited to have you here today, Lori. Would you like to say hi and tell the people about yourself a little bit? Hi, thank you guys for having me. So I'm Lori Ochoa. I am the, I actually own two companies. So I am the co-founder of Bloom Behavioral Health with my husband here in California, the behavioral health company uh, providing behavioral services to children with developmental disabilities. And I'm also the founder of Life by Design, which is a personal development company that specializes in uh, coaching, speaking, workshops, all related, uh, utilizing acceptance and commitment training and coaching to optimize well-being, build resilience, and just help people thrive in life. That's That's a little bit about me. I told everyone after our meeting um, for the pre-interview I feel so much better after just talking to Lori for an hour. Oh. <laughs> it was very, um, I don't know, it was a very cleansing experience. And uh, so I walked away feeling like, I'm going to name this Act for You. Because this, I think this talk today, it's about how to apply Act to just, you know, enhance your own functioning in whatever part of life you want to focus that on or across across your life domains. And so to kind of kick things off, I thought we would do an acty type question for our question of the day. Is acty a word? Can I say it that way? Acty. You just made it a word. Act, the act-ish, act-like. Yeah. Um, so the question is, tell us a brief story about discovering or acting in alignment with your own values. Da, 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 da. <laughs> Who wants to go first? I'll go first. Okay. Uh, why not? So, uh, Shan, great question. Uh, I know that you put the word brief in there because, uh, for me, because you know that I can go on a little bit. So I will keep this brief. But in thinking about this this morning, I thought about uh, many to choose from, but one that I like to share with students. And it was during the doldrums of my dissertation. And it was right on the line. I could have gone either way of like, I'm out of here. This is not happening. And that's because so much of my life had been organized around things that I was pretty good at. And so much of the behavior that uh, sort of collects that eventually produces a dissertation it is not often the strengths that you're there. Um, loved the intellectual side of it. I liked um, what brought me to my topic. But when you're in the middle of it, the, some of those things feel pretty far uh, from reach. And the, like I said, there was a real moment there where it was kind of, I had to decide, am I really going to do this? It was not going great. Uh, it was... Uh, not getting any closer to being done. And I had a moment through some uh, support from my my now wife, uh, and she made a very astute observation. And she noticed that I was not at all curious at all about my research. Mm. It was completely gone. 
curiosity is really important uh, to me. And I didn't even realize I had completely lost track of my curiosity. And I was all about getting it done. And the curiosity was completely uh, absent for me. And in that opportunity, not only did I see that that something that was really important to me was missing, um, but I was able to recapture that. I was uh, able to not be so um, avoidant of my mentor. Uh, <laughs> and, um, and I started to have, a, I mean, I, it's hard to kind of say fun. It's easy in retrospect to say that I was having fun. Um, so I'll just kind of hold on to that part of it. But I, there was some lightness that was brought back to that project. Um, there was more curiosity. I was not afraid of it as much as I had been. And so a, a real shift uh, came back into that and and made uh, probably one of the biggest differences and contributions to something that was really meaningful to me and something that I keep in my back pocket, not only for moments like this, uh, but also when things are feeling a little heavy and uh, a little bit out of reach in terms of things that I, I, I truly care about, but the content is important. I, I remind myself of that, and that has, that, has, that has borne many fruits for me. It's a great story. Um, Nissa, do you want to go next, or do you want me to? We're right. going to save Lori for last. <laughs> I will go. Uh, I'm going to try and keep it brief, very similar to Tim. Um, this was a professional experience in which I was uh, in a scenario where a supervisor that I worked with just was challenging my own scope and value um, in terms of my engagement with an organization that I worked in. And I think that this happens often in our field. You know, um, I, I valued the work. I loved what I was doing, but I didn't think that I was being treated um, with respect and compassion, which is a very, those are very important values to myself. And there were um, many times in meeting with leadership in this organization in determining what to do in my role. Should I stay with it because I love the role, I love the the staff, the client, um, but my values of compassion and respect being first and foremost made me um, move towards the decision of, of change and, and shifting myself out of the org and, and transitioning. And I think while it was very hard, I will say there were moments where I was like, you know what, I can stick with it, I can take it, it'll be fine, I don't need to do this, I don't wanna change, I wanna, I'm very comfortable here. Um, I decided to make the change because I truly believe that compassion was, you know, I want to be treated with compassion. I want compassion to be reflected in every aspect of where I operate and where I work. And um, similar to Tim, it opened doors, you know, making that shift, aligning with my values and saying, whatever happens next, I know I stood by what I value. Um, and it brought me here to Central Reach. So I am so happy that I followed through with it. We are too. <laughs> So, you know, it's interesting how, um, I don't know, life-changing it can be in some of these these real defining moments. For me, the example I'm going to use is, is actually a year, and the year was 2016. And, um, you know, living in the deep south in 2016, growing up in the deep south, being formed in the deep south, yeah. I know and love a lot of people who think very differently from me politically. And all the life I thought that, that that had that had worked out. There was respect and um, we could listen to each other. We could definitely stay in the same room. Um, and then when 2016 happened, I remember walking away from the voting booth um, because I, I could walk to my home from where I voted. And and knowing just from what I saw what the outcome was going to be and being sad about the outcome of the election, but also being devastated at what I saw being honored in human behavior and what people, how people were interacting with, with each other, talking to each other. This, this, it just seemed like hatred and jumping to conclusions that were very negative and assuming the worst in people who don't think like you. Um, on both sides, I felt, and I just, at that moment, in that moment in time, I think I was trying to decide, do I want to move to Australia or England? Um, <laughs> but later, as, as I grew in this, um, I really sort of grabbed onto this basic behavior analytic philosophy of people are doing the best they can. 
And that's really hard to hold on to sometimes when people are just, they're so far away from where you are. It is so hard and you want to question everyone's motives. Um, But since that time, I have really worked hard on avoiding snark, sarcasm, and immediately writing people off as as not worthy. Um, And it's made a huge difference in me in terms of my own happiness my own physical health, my own mental health, just making that one shift. So I feel so much better (laughs) believing that people are doing the best that they can. But Lori, I'm really anxious to hear your story. What what have you got for us? Well, I'm, thank you for sharing. And I'm going to go off of the year because I like that. So I've always valued being inspired and inspiring others. I value connection and contribution. And I never forget the year in 2014 when my son was born profoundly deaf. And he was an infant. He was only three months old. And they basically said, your son is not mild or moderate. He's profoundly deaf. And at the time, I didn't even really know what that meant. You know, the audiologist is talking to me about cochlear implants and just the options and the therapies. But interesting full circle moment was prior to that, I was already a behavior analyst because I became a behavior analyst in 2008. So I was already a practicing behavior analyst, working with families, mentoring, supervising, and now I'm in those shoes. And I remember thinking to myself, I have this amazing science. I have the tools to help my son. And everybody kept saying, you are your son so lucky and so blessed to have you and your husband because he's also a doctoral behavior analyst you know your son's so lucky to have you guys as parents you know we knew the system we knew at the time regional center we knew how to get him services but what was missing was i didn't have tools to help myself I was just sort of going through the process and the routine. And here I'm a a behavior analyst, almost kind of experiencing this like imposter syndrome, if you will. Like, well, I should be able to help myself. And I'm experiencing, you know, stress and overwhelm as a new mom. And then on top of that, now he's in occupational therapy, physical therapy, speech therapy, early intervention, you know, audiological services. He's in all these therapies. And I'm just still processing what I thought life was going to be like as a new mom. And what was showing up for me was grief, anger, sadness, guilt, because, oh, I should be happy. I'm a new mom. He's healthy. So I was experiencing all this, you know, emotion, these private events, and didn't have the tools to effectively cope and manage. So that's what served as the catalyst. And we can talk more about that to really dive into acceptance and commitment therapy or really acceptance and commitment training to learn these tools so I can start adopting them into my life and build this lifestyle of being able to effectively process my pain and still show up authentically to inspire and to, for me to be inspired and to inspire others and to continue to offer connection and contribution because at the time I wasn't able to do that. And so that kind of led me into that path uh, toward um, connecting to my values, which I want to be inspired 
And I want to be able to inspire others, empower others to really live their best life and thrive. Okay. It's a great jumping off point into our discussion today, really. So thank you. And I, I will pause this just a moment to say the first secret word for our CEU seekers, and that is stage, S-T-A-G-E, stage. All right. So let, let, let's kind of look at some of those concepts. And um, one of the things that you said in, in your talk, Lori just now was this um, basically emotional load mm -hmm. that as a behavior analyst in your training, I'm thinking, am I reading into what you're saying that, that your behavior analytic training did not provide you the tools that you need to help yourself with this emotional load? Correct. So I was blessed to have wonderful professors and we learned about RFT. And we learned about that and we learned its application to an extent working with, you know, our, our client, but we never really learned its application to ourselves. And however, the theory and the philosophy of our science, I always went back to that in terms of uh, it being a compassionate science, because I realized I'm not broken. I, I'm just having a human experience. And in our science, it's, I, I like to call it the very compassionate science because we are not blaming the person. We're just looking at the behavior, right? So I was like, okay, my behavior is what needs to change. My relationship with my private events and how I'm relating that's what needs to change, not me as a human, you know, because we can go down that rabbit hole like I'm broken, I something's wrong with me, why am I not, I'm a behavior analyst, I should be able to fix this. And, you know, I think we're very, um, I was actually on a, a, a training the other day with other behavior analysts and another behavior analyst said, and I thought this was such a great point, like as behavior analysts, we have a tendency to say like, we identify the problem and we should be able to fix it, you know, and therein lies the problem, right? Because it's, well, wait, you're human. You're a mom having a real raw human experience, which is valid. And maybe there's nothing there to be fixed other than just give yourself permission to process and be with your pain. And I just, I can go on about, yeah, I'll, I'll stop there, but. Um, I think it's very uh, powerful, our science, and I just love how we have this, these, these tools, we have this technology to help others. I'm just a huge proponent of, can we utilize these same tools and technology to help ourselves? Because we're human too. Well, Lori, that's that really great. Thank you so much for that, and certainly... I, you know, I don't want to speak for Nessa, but no disagreement here. That's a that's a really that's a really nice sentiment to share. I, one thing that uh, I, just as you were talking, that I was so curious about, and given um, certainly acts uh, prominence in sort of uh, experiential meaning, it, it you really have to come from yourself to be able to deliver it anything else. I'm curious about how you sort of. Okay, we you kind of learn about it, but really bringing that in for yourself. Sure, yeah. I mean, I'm. I don't think I'm being terribly clear, but maybe you can find a thread to pull on from that. No, you are because in 2016, Dr. Hayes started. Well, I actually don't know when he officially launched his boot camps, but at the time he didn't have boot camps for behavior analysts. Um, now he does. Now there are boot camps for behavior analysts. But at the time, it was an ACT boot camp. So I remember going down to San Diego. There were the 150 attendees. Of the 150 attendees, there was 10 behavior analysts. Okay. I was one of Ouch. the 10. Yeah, right? Everybody else was clinical psychologists, social workers, yeah. uh, you know, therapists, mental health counselors. So I'm sitting at this table and I'm the only behavior analyst 
And day one, he's talking about RFT. And I'm like, oh, I got this. Like, yes, <laughs> this all makes sense. Transformation is stimulus, but, you know, he's talking all the lo- the language, right? And the social worker next to me is like, looking like a deer in headlights. Like, what in the world is I talking about? So, you know, day one is theory, philosophy, the underpinnings of ACT and how this is rooted in behavioral science. Day two is a completely different story. So he goes, in order for you to truly learn at, you're going to learn these experiential exercises and apply it to yourself. And now I'm a fish out of water, right? Like, I'm like, ah, this is uncomfortable. I don't want to do this. You know, because it wasn't just, oh, let's learn these tools about how to work with our clients, it was, no, we're going to learn these tools for yourself. And, 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 and you know what? I thought this is exactly what I need. I'm so glad that I put myself in that situation because I wanted to learn the experiential aspect of it to adopt these strategies in my own personal life. Yeah. And I since did- then, I've been continuing to do workshops and and work books and and just immerse myself in those types of trainings. I tend to be a little bit, um, I don't know, opinionated about (laughs) training behavior analysts, um, behavior analytic professionals, and anyone who's going to use behavior analysis, whether they're going to be identified this way or not. And as you say that, it makes me think about the, 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 The history that I have with teaching, even at the undergraduate level, the graduate level, whatever, we always do this behavior change on yourself thing as part of what you have to do. And as a teacher, 90% of the people are going to turn in, I'm either going to study more or I'm going to exercise more. And those are the two goals. And it, it, although I think that it's great and you need to learn how to do that, it's such so much more of a meaningful change if you're looking at something that you're trying to integrate um, at a deeper level than just something that you're going to tempor- temporarily do. Because that's what we're trying to use behavior analysis for, whether it's, it's ACT or RFD or it is just, you know, teaching young children to read. We are looking to do things that are going to really change people's lives on a permanent level. And I love this whole idea of that you you have to participate in it. You have to really know what that feels like to be on the receiving end. I love the concept of using it on yourself because I think to um, going to the compassionate part of the science and that, you know, empathy is a key component of compassion and being able to walk in someone else's shoes. So if you're thinking about using these concepts on a client or even a parent who is struggling with grief with a diagnosis and how to change the view of the trajectory of their child's development in life, if you haven't utilized some of these components of act on yourself and how you're sitting with your emotions, it will be difficult to guide that parent uh, through that experience. So I, I can see it from the, as our field grows and develops, um, act and practicing and engaging in that as a clinician with our own feelings would be a great way for us to be more compassionate with the families that we serve versus, you know, here's your treatment plan, here are the hours that I have experienced some of this um, maybe in a very different role, but a similar experience. I've sat with it and felt it, and I understand what that grief might be like for you. I'm not experiencing it with you, but I can at least um, share that I've I've worked through some of these scenarios myself. I can see that being very helpful. Absolutely. Just even normalizing. So in ACT, you know, we, we learn about like normalizing this experience of being human and having uncomfortable thoughts, feelings, and emotions because that's part of the human experience, right? And and we have complex human language. And just taking that perspective alone to normalize it for yourself, you can then normalize that for a parent that you're serving. And rather than seeing it as a problem, like, oh, I need to fix or I need to, I'm uncomfortable when they have emotion, or I, I don't know how to react, or I want to challenge, or 
you can just normalize that experience, right? Because you've normalized that for yourself that, okay, this, they're, they're just going through a very normal human response in yep. that moment. And how can I relate to that? Because, oh, I've also had those experiences in my own life, right? It might not be having a child with a developmental disability, but we've all had some experience in our life, right? Where we've experienced those painful thoughts and emotions as well. And um, yeah, I, so go ahead. Yeah. I, I'm sorry. No, I I was just thinking about this time. I was freaking out, just coming unglued about something that I had done. And I felt stupid and I felt like um, if people knew, they would all be you know, embarrassed for me. They would be laughing at me, you know, all of that. And I had talked to a couple of friends about it, um, but I, I eventually picked up the phone and called my best friend from third grade, <laughs> who is an accountant. And I said, this is what I did. And this is all the freak outs I'm having about it. And she said, what's wrong with that? And it instantly just brought me down. And I was able to move on with life, but she was the, the accountant was the first person who, who thought to just say that to me. And it is, it's so extremely powerful. And I think, you know, sometimes as you're describing Lori, behavior analysts get nervous when we start talking about this sort of thing and wondering if it's their role and should they make a referral and does this person need mental health counseling? How do you walk that line between when it's okay? And this, uh, I know that this is a big part of, of your work too. When do you know that it's okay to just do some empathizing and working and, and talking through that versus you need to refer them for counseling? For me, I really see apps as life tools. I, I really see these six processes as tools in our tool belt that we can utilize and, and, and it's not just in our practice, like I, because I, I do, I'm personal development coach and I actually work with people outside of our field. That's actually the main population that I work with it, are not behavior analysts. And so I, I really try to, and actually tomorrow I'm speaking at uh, Santa Ana College, I'm speaking to college students. So I try to deliver these tools as integral life skills that are going to help you to be more resilient, mindful, be more present and engaged with life, connect with your values and your why and why this matters to you, how you can be more effective in, in, in normalizing the experience of stress and anxiety. Like this is being a part of being a human and do you have the tools to effectively process manage and cope where it's workable in your life so you can continue to thrive and take action despite these challenges that are going to come your way so i really come at it from a lens of these are life tools these are life skills that everybody if you're human with complex human language everybody's go gonna gonna be able to benefit from it you know however if, you know you're starting to see like chronic persistent you know stress um depression and uh anxiety and it and it's their severe symptoms and obviously there's definitely a time and a place for people to go and seek additional support um but from my lens in terms of the work that I do as a personal development coach and speaking to, you know, employees and, and company, you know, well-being and uh, speaking to Santa Ana College students or, you know, the, the, the groups and the organizations that I'm a part of. They want just tools to optimize their well-being, resilience and thrive. Um, that's sort of uh, the take that I that I uh, uh, that my approach uh, with with everybody. Nissa, what do you what do you say? Like, yeah. if you're doing an intake and and you're being very compassionate and you're get, getting all of this information, what kind of guidance do you give people? 
So it's a little bit, I mean, I think that you can bring in a lot of what Lori just mentioned in terms of just um, the value. Initially, in a lot of the, the training we provide for assessment and bringing in compassionate care and culturally responsive care, it's really understanding the why. What was your, a lot of our behavior analyst why into getting into the field, right? And then you can take that same why for any other um, healthcare provider, nursing, palliative care, um, some doctors, and really look at um, that compassionate component by referring back to Bailey and Birch and their 25 essential skills for behavior analysts, talking about that very first meeting with the family and the rapport building with the family being so important in terms of um, how we articulate our practice to a consumer, how we allow the family to share their experience and what brought them to our doors for that first intake or even that ongoing intake and saying, hey, I am, like Laura's saying, an, a human sitting here with you, listening to you. Um, if this is a first meeting, you're likely grieving, trying to understand this diagnosis you've received, um, trying to understand what ABA is. And in that, you know, you can even rely on the literature by Taylor and colleagues in 2019 and then Roar and colleagues in 2021, where it's like, as behavior analysts, maybe you don't have training in acts. You need to rely more on a prescriptive model of compassionate care, which means you need to listen and ask open-ended questions. You know, if you're not able to lean into act um, treating, maybe you've got to just have a very clear, when you listen without intention, you're allowing that family to share their story. And... Um, as you're listening to that story, if there are components that they share that are beyond your scope and competence, you might need to refer out or reach out to a supervisor and say, you know, they, they shared a couple things that I'm just not comfortable with. It's starting to hit some red flags. Um, and I'd love to have a second eye on this family. But I think there's an area where, you know, we've got literature now uh, from our own field in compassionate care. We've got some of the ACT literature, and then we've got um, other allied health, care, health professionals in human services to say, here are all ways to really build rapport that shows that we are compassionate, that we're navigating that human experience with a family. Um, and here's our scope within that treatment. And then there are some markers that are going to be beyond our scope where it is time to refer out for mental health counseling and support that we aren't able to provide. You know, I, I want to talk about this because it's the number one question that's going to come back in the feedback on this. Um, I don't want to perseverate on it because so many talks on ACT do end up talking about this scope issue. But, Tim, I know that you also are a person who's got a lot of training in all of these areas and, and worked with young kids. And how did you strike that balance? How did you did you use ACT when you were working directly with kids? Yeah, you know, I think uh, it's a good question. I think the scope of competence is, a, is an important thing for us to bring up whether or not we're talking about something uh, like ACT um, or, you know, frankly, anything within our discipline, especially a discipline that has such a far reach human behavior. Um, you, you know, we can have a little bit of, uh, dare I say, arrogance. Uh, my subject matter is the totality of the human experience. And so I think that that uh, navigating that um some people do it really well. Uh, some people do it really well sometimes and do it poorly other times. Again, the totality of the human experience enables us to have a little bit of any of those options. There have been times where I've been a little bit over my skis, uh, to use a metaphor here. Maybe I'm a little outside of my comfortability. Uh, maybe I am... Uh, how do I want to say? Um, and you don't always know it in the moment, let's say. And this is why I think having such an important network, never being alone, never being by yourself, never being an island, but really having a strong network of colleagues that you're working with or are consulting with um, and making sure that whenever you are, uh, you, you know, you don't just go to an ACT boot camp and come out and say, ready to go. I'm, I'm now, you know, they don't do certification. Other types of Psychotherapies uh, do have certain things. You could you could look at uh, you know DBT as an example of something that, and there's some you know that's a that's a topic for another time. But um, Steve and I, you know obviously there are there are many others, uh, not just uh, not just Steve Hayes, but uh, but others early on in the development of ACT that that made the the choice of you know we're not going to go down the route of certification. We really want this to be accessible to everyone and and. Uh, Lori, when you described uh, your experience in that in that ACT boot camp that wasn't designed specifically for behavior analysts, but really uh, when you when you shared the, the kind of scope of, of different professionals in there, I think um, 
I think that that brings a point of pride for uh, many act, act practitioners that that you don't need to be a particular thing, a particular credential to be able to to utilize this. Um, and I think that the community that the that uh, contextual behavior science has created is a is a laudable one for so many reasons. It's pretty inclusive. Uh, it's very um, self reflective, and I think that those qualities that they have are shared by many of those that align closely with that. Um, I try not to, in my own, in, in my own, in my clinical practice side of things, you know, I don't really put on the hat of like, I'm going to, now I'm going to use act like it's a tool. Um, that doesn't, I can't authentically do that. I think it can work for some, but for me, it never really worked. Uh, I try not to make it seem so blatant, but I try to bring myself to that. Nissa, you said something that I wrote down really struck me. I think it's probably the one thing that we get the least amount of training, but the best behavior analysts do it better than almost anyone. And that's rapport building. You know, nobody teaches you how to build rapport, but the people that can do it well are usually the best behavior analysts because they have a humility about themselves. They're willing to uh, really receive other people. And in that receiving of other people, they find themselves probably miles ahead of others that are more. Um, I don't. I don't know. I don't want to be. I don't want to be dismissive of, of of any approach. So I'm. I'm reluctant to to pick on one word versus another. Um, but for me, when things have gone well, it's because I built good rapport. It's because I have attempted to to take. Uh, and learn as much as I can about acts, uh, use it for my own life. Um, and through that, I'm not a therapist. I'm not going to provide therapy uh, from a clinical perspective in that regard. And so when I've worked with parents and certainly with kids, I'm not taking a, a clinical psychology approach to this. But you're darn certain I'm going to do some things like we're going we're, we're gonna to take a moment, we're going to do some breathing. And that's not me like, you know, now I'm pulling an act card and now I'm going to do mindfulness. That feels inauthentic to me. Um, but, but sort of building out your scope of competency to include things that are broader than just maybe prescriptive behavior analytic strategies. I'm going to establish stimulus controls. I'm going to use mindfulness. I think, um, I think once you get out of that sort of uh, tool belty type thing, and you really start to uh, become more fluent moving through these different approaches. Um, it doesn't come across as super weird when you're talking to parents, talking to kids. Those are, that was my. Primary. I don't think it does either. For me, it is um, because I am cross trained and, and duly licensed. I didn't think a whole lot about it. You know, it was just. It, it, if if the family member is roadblocked because of, of guilt or stress or grief or whatever, just to spend some time during that conversation and we're talking about that. And um, I never thought a lot about it. And then started really looking after I <laughs> got the behavior analytic credential later and realizing, oh, wait, there, there's so much emphasis on compartmentalizing that responsibility to compartmentalize. If you're functioning as a behavior analyst right now, you have to be a behavior analyst and you can't be anything else while you're being a behavior analyst. And so it's been something that um, just as a, as a human being before I worried about it from that perspective, Tim, I'm like, that it's just sort of ingrained in who I am. This is how I talk to people. Um, I, I can at the end of that conversation say, you know, if, if you want to talk some more about this, I can give you some names. But um, I can see that if people who might go the opposite way, credential as behavior analyst first and then get the add on, they may have more um, mental or emotional stumbling blocks about that. Just trying to play by the rules. OK, but I said we're not going to dwell on this all day. So let's move on. <laughs> Second secret word is honor. H-O-N-O-R. And can we kind of dive in a little bit? One of the things that I've had some really fun conversations with Tim and with Lori about just the concept of acceptance and self as context. Both of those are um, 
act concepts that I believe get frequently misunderstood. And I love the way both of you talk about that. So, um, Lori, you want to kind of kick us off? What do you think is misunderstood a lot about the concept of acceptance? What does that mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I actually prefer the word willingness. I think acceptance, people have this misconception that you have to accept the discomfort. You're, and, and really what it is, is it acceptance is about having a willingness and an openness to be with your experience, your private experience, and also your experience as it's happening in the present moment. And acceptance is about having a willingness to notice it without judgment. So it's noticing what's showing up for me right now because I am human, because I have language and I have an instructional history. What's showing up for me? Can I, do I have a willingness to just be with that right now? Notice maybe even name. I'm noticing that I am experiencing, you know, thoughts of unworthiness. I'm noticing that I am experiencing, you know, anxiety right now. And just being with that from a place of a willingness and an openness without judgment is acceptance. Oh, Lori, that was so good. That was great. I love that willingness aspect of it. That's a, that's, I wrote that down. I'm going to take that. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. I find that resonates for, for most people. Um, I know for me, uh, I, it's funny, I was resistant to the word accepted initially. And um, when I heard the, the word willingness and I was like, oh, that resonates for me because you're, you're willing, you're open, you're, and that's really the, the, the idea around act is an openness, an openness to be with your experience. Yeah. I just had to have a deep breath for a moment. Um, yeah, because I do think sometimes people uh, like me, may get a little bit um, stuck there when you say just notice it. All right. I've noticed it. <laughs> that is not enough for me. I have noticed that I am very angry with you right now. <laughs> um, and I did you know, part of my 2016 growth was, I think, putting that into place, not knowing that's what I was doing, that I know you are going to say these things that are going to hurt my ears. And I know that if I engage with you, we are going to, it's going to harm our relationship. And so I'm going to accept that there are parts of you that I love with all of my heart and that I'm going to embrace those pieces and I have to, I have to accept this limitation of what I will and will not be able to, even if I could engage with it, let's say this person just for argument's sake is my mother. Okay. Mm -hmm. Let's just say that. I accept that there are things that my mother says and does that no matter what I do will never change. Um, and so because I value our relationship, because there are all these other things, I can't just see her as that thing, that per that that thing I don't like. Um, and it really is a big shift internally that's hard to put into words. And I do think that that's what we run across with in some of these concepts with ACT is that until you felt it, it's very hard to understand how powerful it is. It can sound kind of silly, to be honest. So if I could just, I think that's so great, Shannon, because when you, it, it's, it's rather than reacting 
Excuse me. It's it's taking a moment to notice what's showing up for you. Name it. Okay, I'm I'm experiencing resentment. I'm experiencing anger. I'm experiencing that process in and of itself now gives you time to then choose in that moment how you want to respond and act in accordance with your values toward right. that person. Right. So that's that's the idea. Yeah. It it can I notice what's showing up for me so I don't my I'm not reacting off of that emotion. I'm re I'm responding from a place that's aligned with how I choose to show up in this relationship, how I choose to respond in life. That's a very powerful tool. That's a very powerful process and technique that that is 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 um a lot of what I coach. Yeah. And it, it parallels very nicely to some work I've done in the past with kids who have impulsive behavior, right? The mm -hmm. behavior plan says insert a pause. We didn't prescribe for them what you're going to do in that pause. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that would be a place maybe I would be able to, Tim, reach into my axe backpack and say, okay, while we're in the pause, this is what we do. Um, so yeah, I, I really like that. A lot of this is resonating with me for a couple of reasons. And this may, you know, for any listeners out there who I'm about to make a statement, uh, I feel like I'm going to, you can give me back to Shannon later, but there will be going to be a lot of head nods. But for a parent who is a behavior analyst, there is a large component, and I have a lot of colleagues and friends who see this, where there are times when I don't use my principles on my children. Um, and I'm speaking very specifically to one of my three children, Lucy, who I love. She doesn't listen to the podcast, but she knows I love her. She is my most difficult child. She's my middle, my only daughter. And, um, and Sharon has heard many times that she, there are many situations between the two of us where she will um, cause reactions in me that make me go into moments of, I'm not equipped to parent her. I, you know, I am so frustrated. I'm so emotional. I can't handle this. I, I mean, I've even said in the last few months, I need help. I need a behavior analyst where I am just like, how can I not parent this child with all of the training that I have in managing children with difficult behavior? Mm -hmm. um, but there are times in my life with this child where it's very difficult and I do have to step back and say, I am feeling completely incompetent. Take away my certification. I don't know what I'm doing with this child in particular, where um, if I fall into those emotions, I am in a whirlwind of I can't even open my computer and work today. Um, I'm just stuck in that, like, we had a bad interaction. Now I'm a terrible behavior analyst and I'm a terrible mom where I do have to check myself and say, hey, hold on, step it back a little bit. Let's walk it back and let's see, like, who are you? What are you capable of? And this is very different because it's so emotionally tied to my heart that I'm not, you know, using the tools in my backpack or toolbox or, you know, um, in my garage to help me work through this. But in the most recent few weeks, we've, we've struggled a lot this year. She's going through puberty. It's a very difficult year for us. Um, where the stepping back piece has allowed me to let her kind of have her, her peaks, where I used to peak with her and then we were just a mess, where she will peak and I'll just step back and give her that time to have these emotional outbursts. And I'm just remaining calm, taking a deep breath, saying, I'm not a bad mom. I'm not, I'm not a bad mom. I can handle this. Just let her do her thing. And and then even bringing it full circle, leaning into the rest of my friends who have 11, 12-year-old daughters and saying, it is what I'm feeling normal because I feel like I'm way outside of my scope here. Um, so I think that using this on ourselves is so important, not just as behavior analysts, but as parents in general. I, I could not agree with you more, Nissa. Yeah. And I, and I think at the end of the day, you kind of nailed it. it it's because it's so close to your heart and it matters. Yeah. And, and, and I think that's where we're going to experience more of those thoughts and more of those emotions. Right. And, and, and really in the acceptance and commitment coaching that I do, it's all about what's workable. Right. So what, what it's looking at, okay, what's workable for one child might not be what's workable for the other, right? 
And I can relate because I have two boys. They're completely night and day. Night and day. And 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 it's it's again normal, right? We're normalizing the experience. Like, okay, I'm ex- am I a bad mom? I don't know how to parent. I'm a behavior analyst. I should be able to. And it, and so having all those thoughts and emotions is it's just like normalizing that experience for ourselves, right? As moms, hey, I, this matters to me. I'm going through a very normal experience. Right. I feel like I'm having a therapy session right now. I know. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Come away from this. So much lighter. <laughs> All right. I'm going to give the third secret word. And, and um, we are kind of running towards the end. So I want to touch on self as context. So get your thoughts together while I say this really, really long final secret word, which is me. Yeah, me. All right. Let's talk about self as context. <laughs> Take it away. What is, can you kind of briefly explain self as context in a way that is going to help us understand it very quickly? Lori? Do you want me to? Yeah. Do you want to? Yeah. Okay. So um, there's self as content, right? So self as context. So the content is the language. So I might say, here's, here's, here's a, here's a cup, right? We all agree this is a cup. And then I say, What's wrong with the cup? Shannon, what's wrong with the cup? There's nothing wrong with the cup. There's nothing wrong with the cup. <laughs> so, so let's say we find, we said, what's wrong with the cup? And that occasions your language, okay. right? It's not like, pink. All right. It's not a pink. Cup. It's, okay. it's not, right? It's, it's okay. not that, right? Yeah. So self is content or context is basically just that we 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 take we have language and it's the language and the meaning and the description that we give to about life events others and ourselves the meaning so we might call it even the story so if it's raining outside it's raining my son is deaf but now there's all this meaning and narrative and language that I'm giving about those events. And then there's, le- so I am me, I am Lori, I am, and then I could say, I am blank, 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 blank. I am this, I am not, I am here, I am there. And so all those perspectives, all those contextual cues, right? Those relational frames. So this is all the description, the self-description that I'm saying about myself the belief in myself, what I believe is true or not to be true. So it's the lens with which I'm viewing myself in life. Hope that I, I don't know, Tim, do you want to add? No, I just think it's really great. And Lori, I, you know, to, to, um, to praise you, you've modeled something so well for us in this conversation in, instead of saying something like I'm sad, You'll say, I'm experiencing sadness. You, you're, I mean, you, I've noticed that throughout our conversation. You're just like such a, a wonderful model of that. And I think that that gets at the root of self as context, which is this idea, which is also, you can kind of see a little diffusion in that too. You, you, you separate yourself from your thoughts, feelings, emotions, not to diminish or discount them. They're meaningful. They are important, but they are not you. They are separate from you you're experiencing those things and um and i yeah i i I, nothing uh, but praise uh for the model that you've demonstrated for us and the listeners i think it's i think it's great and such a big shift i've seen this in a big way with kids struggling uh with with tough academic areas when they can not feel like it's something about them but it's Mm -hmm. just something that they're experiencing right now Right. Mm-hmm. And that they don't experience it all the time. And in fact, they can actually predict pretty accurately in, you know, in 20 minutes. Do you think you're going to feel that way? Well, no, because in 20 minutes, I'm going to be doing this. And you're like, oh, okay. So you're not that, are you? And you, you, I, I feel like kids get it almost. They can get it so quickly. It's us old folks that struggle a little bit more because we've really connected ourselves so closely to things that they matter to us. Um, 
you know, we, 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 we kind of focus on the icky stuff, but look at it on the good thing. Smart. You don't want to diffuse from that. You want to be, oh, no, 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 I am that. I am. Well, okay. Yeah. You're experiencing what it feels like to be smart, but have you ever felt dumb? You know, I mean, there's just these kinds of games that we can sort of play. And I think looking at it as, as it mu- as much for the icky stuff as it is for the good stuff in our lives can also provide a nice contrast um, to, again, making it more accessible to us. I think you've, you've used the, the phrase normalizing. Uh, but yeah, no, it's, it's fabulous. I do like that to you. And um, it reminds me of a thing that we used to do when I had kids in therapy sessions where they had those kinds of ideas. We'd put the um, descriptors on what we call the slider and you would slide yourself around and, and, and here I'm smart and here I'm dumb and here my dad is smart and here my dad is dumb, you know, and just kind of, and it was always a lot of fun. And I do appreciate the way the, both of you are giving these examples makes it so relatable and makes it, um, yeah, when you can laugh your way through it, you know, you're getting somewhere. <laughs> Love it. Um, all right. So I guess we're going to have to start uh winding this down i do want to um ask Lori. are you said you mentioned you have a talk coming up are there are there places that people can get more information about your work or to hear some of your other talks sure well first of all thank you guys for having me i we could just probably go on all day (laughs) um but yes you can find me i am in the process of updating my website but you can find me at drlorioochoa.com I am on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn um, at Dr. Lori Ochoa, and I'm really excited. I'm going to be launching an eight-week masterclass uh, coming up in in August, September. So it's going to basically be eight weeks of modules, and the modules are going to go through each of the apps uh, processes, and it but it's going to be specifically for personal and self development. So it's it's this really giving people these strategies and tools in a way that's tangible. Like right now, I'm just kind of giving you those examples of this. It's tangible, it's digestible, because again, I'm not working with, I'm working with the general population. And I really want people to digest these strategies and concepts, because sometimes that's all it takes for people is just a perspective shift. It's just a different relationship with how they're relating to their thoughts. It's getting clear on their values. It's having more workable action or understanding like, oh, that's experiential avoidance. Like, yeah, that's what I do in my life. That moves me away from thriving. Okay. So it's just giving people these strategies, these concepts rooted in act. And um, I'm really excited to be launching that um, come August, September. So stay tuned and you can find more information about that on uh, my social media and my website. Great. Wonderful. Yeah. All right. Um, Tim, Nissa, anything coming up that we need to let people know about? Where can you be? Sorry? What will you be doing? <laughs> Later this year in the fall. <laughs> Um, well, first off, Glory, thank you. It's wonderful to meet you. Uh, what a great conversation. Uh, thank you, uh, Shannon and Nissa for letting me, uh, do my best carry impression. Probably didn't do as well as I did. Maybe I'll, I'll try harder next. Yeah. Hard to get that carry thing down, but it was really lovely to, to be with you all today. And, um, you know, if you're interested in some of these act components, there are a ton of resources out there. Uh, Lori had mentioned, uh, the ACT boot camps for behavior analysts, again, making it even more accessible for those of us trained primarily in behavior analysis. Uh, but then it does not take long to, uh, to find great resources online, many of those uh, free uh, in, in many instances. For me personally, really excited about bringing some of these ACT components into our uh, parent support curriculum that we've got coming out through Care Coordinator at Central Reach. Uh, that has been a, a really invigorating outlet for me to take some of these things that I have been able to hone over years in working with parents and kids, but really deliver it in a way that could be accessible to not only behavior analysts who are doing parent training, parent support uh, activities, um, but to have that foundation because there's, 
you know, we, we sort of see the intuitive line that you can create the A to B of, of like, well, this makes a lot of sense. How, how could it not uh, be so helpful for parents? But it, it's, uh, it's not been terribly accessible to parents uh, in, in that regard. So something that I'm really excited about. Yeah, me too. And I will go ahead and throw out there that we do have some ACT and RFT content on the CR Institute. If you guys just want to search under Dr. Tim Fuller's name, you'll see several opportunities there if you want to learn more. Oh, she froze completely. All right. Everyone froze for a second, so I have no idea. I'm hoping that that went. (laughs) Nissa, anything before we go? Uh, Yes. First of all, I've always been a big fan of Lori since second aid we've been friends (laughs) since way back when in the 80s um and i mean you know such a big fan love watching your career grow and develop and i love listening to your um your posts on instagram and facebook i'm always inspired it always leaves me with a little something to think about in my week if i check it um for me i am launching the assessment mentoring cohort so i am working with cr assessments we're launching the combined ABLES and AFLES uh, here at ABAI, and I know this will post after ABAI, but um, if you're listening to this into the month of June, we'll be having a free mentoring cohort every few weeks where you can join us. We're going to be talking about why we combined the assessments. We're going to be inviting Dr. Partington to talk about how he designed the scoring system of the ABLES and the AFLES. That's a big, hot topic. Everybody wants to know why it was designed the way it was. Um, And then we'll be talking about uh, a couple of other components of assessments and how to support uh, teachers and clinicians using them. And yeah, and if you're seeing this, you know, in the fall or the winter, we we're keeping the recordings available, so you can you can find it um, after the fact if you miss the live cohort. All right, Lori, thank you so much for being with us today. This has been so fun and I feel as light as I did the first time we talked and I don't know, maybe, maybe I just need to take your master class. So please, <laughs> Roy, I'd love to have you. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, thank you guys everyone. for having me. Thank, yes. Yes. Thank you. And thanks everyone for watching. So uh, stay tuned on for information on how to get your CEU. Find us on all the social media outlets and uh, leave us some reviews so people can find more about us. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Thanks for watching this episode of The Behavioral View. To get your CEU, follow the link in the instructions below. You can then go to the attendance verification quiz where you'll enter in the secret words and pay the CEU fee to generate your certificate. If you've already done the work, you may as well get the credit.